Hello everyone and welcome to your first lesson on the B18 topic and the first lesson is all about human population explosion. By the end of this lesson you should be able to explain the importance of biodiversity and link the increase in the human population with waste management and environmental impact. Uh, the quick task is at the bottom of the screen. How many different bins do you have at home? What are they for and why? Why do you have them there? So if you could please um, write down your title day objectives, complete the quick task, pause the video while you do it, and then press play when you're ready to move on. Okay, so um, I don't know how many bins you guys have, but where I live, I have a lot. So firstly, I have um, a bin for glass, tins, uh, plastic bottles. I also have one just for paper and cardboard and then a waste bin for things that are non-recyclable. Um, I also have a garden waste bin. I don't know if you guys have a garden waste bin or not, but I, we do a lot of gardening and mowing the lawn and stuff. So we, we've got one of those as well, as well as having our own composter. And lastly, we've got um, a food waste bin. So sometimes they're gray or that little caddy you have inside is gray, but the bin you have outside normally is green. So all the food waste goes in those. So obviously the reason we have these, as you know, is for recycling. Um, and that's so that we're producing less waste. So I remember when I was a child, we literally only had this bin, the waste bin. If you wanted to recycle because you were a very conscientious person, and um, they used to have the big recycling bins um, down at the supermarket. So you'd have to drive and stand there and put it all in. But to be honest, not a lot of people did it because we didn't realize that back then, like how important our environmental impact was. Um, the other thing I'm, and I'm sure you're wondering why I've put these pictures on here, the soya milk and the apple juice. So if you have a Tetra pack, you might think it goes in the paper or cardboard recycling, but it doesn't. It goes in this one. Well, it does in my council anyway, but just check in your area which um, bin your Tetra pack cartons go into because they tend not to go in paper and cardboard. They tend to go in with the plastics. So there you go. It's just something that people tend to mix up when they're recycling. Thought I'd include it. Okay, so your starter task is a bit of an odd one. What do you think the world population of humans was at the start of the reigns of each of these monarchs? So the first British King Ethelstan, King Henry VIII, and our current Queen Elizabeth II. What do you think the world population of humans was when they first were crowned? Pause the video, have a think or a chat about it if you're watching this video with someone, and then I'll give you the answers. So here are the approximate answers. So King Ethelstan was the first um, British king to rule England as a group rather than in the different regions, which, the, which was the previous method of ruling. And um, that was in 927 AD, Anno Domini. That means after year zero, when Christ was supposedly born. And the population of the earth was 188 million. That is actually a really, really small number compared to the population of the Earth today. Um, if you wanted to compare it to something, um, the population of Pakistan is currently about 212 million. So there were less people alive in the whole world when Ethelstan was king than there currently are living in just one country, Pakistan. OK, let's look at Henry VIII. So when Henry VIII was on the throne, the population had more than doubled in that amount of time. So from 927 AD, so let's say a thousand years, up to 1,500 years, so that's 500 years different, the population had more than doubled, it gone up to 461 million. Between 1509 and 1952, which we were looking at approximately 400 years, there's a massive jump. Suddenly, there are 2.8 billion people in the world. That was when Elizabeth II came to the throne. Now, she's still our reigning monarch now, and the population of the earth is more than 7 billion. So let's have a look at that as a graph. And here we are. So the reason this graph starts here at 10,000 BC, 10,000 before Christ, is um, this is the time at which um, archeologists believe, and paleontologists, sorry, believe, that humans started settling down. They stopped being hunter-gatherers and they settled down into agricultural life, which means farming. So they grew their crops and they farmed animals rather than foraging for crops and going out to hunt animals. And over this massive long period of time, 8,000 BC, 6,000 BC, 4,000 BC, 2,000 BC, right up until the year zero, when, um, which is, as I said, probably when people believe Jesus was born, it was a little bit later, actually. Um, this population, you can see it hasn't changed much. OK, then from here, the population slowly starts to increase until 
here suddenly we've got a massive increase and this is because of the way our world changed um, i'm going to talk about that a bit more later and here we have the projected population that the un believe um we're going to see in the future so currently we're here over 7 billion and by the year 2100 it's believed that we're going to have more than 10 billion people in the world so, so that's that's quite a lot of human beings taking up the space on our planet so we need resources to live what i want you to do is think about what basic things humans need in order to survive i want you to imagine explaining to an alien from outer space how they would need to care for a one-year-old so what sort of things for survival would a one-year-old need pause the video you can write some bullet points you can have a think about it or you can discuss it and um, when you're ready to press play we'll talk through the answers So in order to survive, we need clean food, water, shelter and waste removal. So thinking about that baby, it needs clean food that is appropriate and nutritious for it and free of illness. Water, also free of illness or pathogens so the baby doesn't get ill. It needs shelter and warmth to keep it safe and healthy. And also waste removal. So a baby would need regularly having its nappy changed and being cleaned up or having a bath. Let's think about that on a wider scale in terms of populations. So this map is from just after the medieval period and um, it's of London so first of all here we can see the South Bank which is not very built up and here is the only bridge originally in London London Bridge here we can see the Tower of London and the walls of London which show the um, outline of uh, the, the city itself so that is the city of London Another thing I want to draw your attention to briefly is this little church here. It's called St. Martin's in the Fields. Obviously, it's called St. Martin's in the Field because it's in the middle of all these fields over here. Now, all of these fields surrounding London would have provided um, agricultural space for growing crops, raising animals and so forth. Why are cities built on rivers? Well, the rivers normally are great for water supply and getting rid of waste. So um, most people would have taken water from wells because that's cleaner. I think that they could possibly have taken river water as well. Um, and the water flows this way. So that means that any waste that's dumped in the river, because the Thames really was just used as a dumping ground, any waste dumped in the river like this would just end up getting drifted out to sea. The problem is that when the population grows, um, how do we make sure that everyone has enough food, water, shelter and waste removal? Well, let's compare this image to a current day image. So this is London in the present. So when we think about things like food, obviously we can grow things in different areas of the country and transport them via trains or uh, goods trains or via trucks and lorries and so forth. When we think about water, we have water companies that purify reservoir water and provide them to our homes running through pipes. Um, when we think about shelter, obviously we can see that London is a lot more built up now and our building um, techniques and abilities are much better than they would have been in the times from the previous map, just post medieval times. And um, lastly, waste removal, where we have sewage systems and treatment plants that can get rid of the waste. So because we have all these conveniences, the population of humans has grown exponentially. It's grown absolutely massively. Now, just to compare the previous picture again, the Tower of London is here. I'm going to change colours because that's not very clear. The Tower of London is here. London Bridge is here, I think. Now, I don't know the exact location of St. Martin the Field at this angle on this picture, but it's probably around here somewhere. And as you can see, it's no longer surrounded by fields. Those fields from the last picture are currently where Trafalgar Square is, and then north of that is sort of where Soho and so forth is. So yeah, the human population has grown massively, and our use of the land has grown too. So previously where there was um, fields or even just uh, woodland and stuff, we have grown uh, and taken that land up and taken it away from nature as such. What I would like you to do is write down these key notes um, fill in the gaps using the words at the bottom. So pause the video, complete this task and press play when you're ready for the answers. And here are your answers. When populations of organisms get too high, nature restores the balance through predation, a lack of resources such as food, water and shelter, or a buildup of waste. 
humans have overcome these problems and the population has exploded to over 7 billion. This causes problems as we use land for living, farming, digging for minerals and dumping waste. We are polluting the air and the sea with our waste and this is problematic for other living things. The next thing I want you to consider is what the word biodiversity actually means. Have a look at the diagram and a think about it. And um, if you need to write bullet points, just have a think or talk to your partner if there's someone you're watching the video with, you can do. When you're ready to move on to the next slide, we'll have a look at what the word biodiversity means. Biodiversity is a measure of the variety of all of the different species of organisms on Earth or within an ecosystem. So when we say biodiversity, we're, broadly, we might be talking about all the uh, organisms living on Earth. But if I was sort of to talk about maybe just one um, habitat or ecosystem, so for example, if I was to talk about the uh, Amazon rainforest, I might say something like the biodiversity in the Amazon rainforest is decreasing. And that's because we're chopping it down to grow um, crops or to farm um, cows on. So um, chopping down the rainforest, bad idea. Because high biodiversity is good because the ecosystem can remain stable. Now, what does that mean? So looking at these pictures at the bottom here, we've got um, a fox with her cub. And these are all the things that British foxes eat. So we've got rabbits, field mice. This is a shrew. We've got a hedgehog and a little common frog. Now, what would happen if all the common frogs in that particular area died out due to disease or overpredation? Well, the fox would be fine. It could eat all these other things here, couldn't it? So even though one animal has died out, the fox would be fine. The other animals would be fine because it's high biodiversity in that area. The problem comes when you don't have high biodiversity. So let's say there's another particular area and all the trees have been chopped down and it's only being used for farmland. So the only organisms able to thrive off those sorts of areas are rabbits because they can live underground and just eat the grass or steal the farmer's crops. Well, let's say the fox, um, the, the, the rabbit gets eaten by the fox. Problem is, if those rabbits suddenly um, contract a new disease and it wipes out all the rabbits in that area, the fox then doesn't have anything to eat either. So the fox is going to die out. So this is an example of low biodiversity. Because of the low biodiversity, if something happens, it means that all the other organisms in that ecosystem are going to be affected. Right. What do these plants have in common? Have a look at these four plants. Pause the video and have a think. You might have heard of some of them, seen them. You might have an inkling. Have a think about it. Pause the video and then I'll tell you uh, the answer in a moment. So the answer to uh, the question is that they all have um, medical or useful uses for humans. So firstly, I'm actually going to start with number four because I imagine many of you have heard of witch hazel because it's in so many facial products that you might have bought and used. So um, witch hazel has soothing or anti-inflammatory properties. So if you have a flare-up of acne or spots on your face, a lot of these products you buy from the shops have witch hazel in to try and calm that down and soothe your skin. Okay, let's move on to willow. Willow bark um, used to be something that people would take off the tree and chew for pain relief. And because um, indigenous or historically people used it in that way, that's how aspirin was discovered. Aspirin or salicyclic acid is what is found in um, willow bark. Another one, quinine, you might have heard of in soft drinks like tonic water. So quinine um, had anti-malarial properties. Um, I think the malaria parasite has actually become um, resistant to that now but um, you've maybe heard of Indian tonic water that's because um, the Indian quinine tree used to be used to make a tonic which is an old-fashioned word for sort of a remedy or a medicine and if you drank it it meant that you were less likely to get severe malarial symptoms I think quinine is still used in some anti-malarial drugs just after you contract malaria it's effective but not in the long term or if you've had malaria for a while Lastly, foxglove. Foxglove is actually poisonous. So if you're out for a walk with your um, pet dog or if you are a horse rider or something like that, you're supposed to avoid foxglove, make sure your um, animal doesn't eat it. And so obviously humans can't because it can cause um, heart palpitations. Now, um, 
Obviously, foxglove unrefined or having too much is bad for you, but actually when it's refined and purified and used as a drug, digitalis is a drug that can be given to people who have irregular heartbeats or if their heart is a bit weak and it can't maintain a pulse. So digitalis can be used to help heart conditions. Now, why, why am I talking about these different plants? Well, um, there is, it's thought that there's something like 5 million plant species out there that we've not discovered yet. They could be hiding in the rainforest that we're halfway through chopping down. If we destroy the rainforest, we're never going to discover these new plants and the helpful properties they have for you. So biodiversity is important, firstly, for what we talked about before, having stable ecosystems. But also, it's important for us because out there, there might be plants that are useful for us for medical purposes or other reasons. What I would like you to do is pause the video here and write a paragraph. And in that paragraph, you need to include what biodiversity is why it's important, and how human population growth impacts on biodiversity. So you're going to need to look at things like how we use land, how we pollute the land, and maybe things about deforestation as well. If you get stuck, you can use the AQA Biology book page 286 or 287, or you can carry out your own research using resources online. So pause the video here and then come back to it once you've finished that paragraph. OK, I'd like you to go back to your um, objectives from the start of the lesson. Um, you need to be able to explain the importance of biodiversity and you need to be able to link the increase in the human population with waste management and environmental impact. So for each of those objectives, please draw a smiley, middle or sad face to say how confident you are in um, being able to do these things. And as usual, I'm going to say if there's anything you're underconfident about, maybe I've not explained it clearly enough, or you think you want to do a bit more in-depth learning, here are some useful resources. You've got the video lessons from Primrose Kitten or Free Science Lessons on YouTube, or the Amoeba Sisters. Um, you've also got BBC Bite Size. Again, there's quizzes, there's resources, there's um, activities and videos and so forth on there. If you prefer um, reading and digesting written information, have a look at the biology book on page 286 or 287. And then there are some other online resources that you have access to, such as Seneca Learning or GCSE Pod. Thanks very much for your hard work today, everyone, and I'll see you next lesson.